Am I audible to you? Yes. Yes, you are. Good. And uh, is the screen visible now to everyone? So we uh, ended last uh, talk with these two words, love and respect. And uh, today I plan to continue uh, elaborating on these two words. In fact, uh, that was a request that came from Metro Church that they would like to know more how the how to on love and respect. So let us first consider the question, what is true love? You know, we are familiar with that, you know, maybe it's sometimes called the Disney World dream, and they lived happily ever after. But that dream is based on groundless human optimism. And it is not based on reality. And that is what we have been fed by the media and the storybooks that we have read. But we must acknowledge that it is merely human optimism and that is not the reality of Christian married life either. Because it defines love as a feeling and if the feeling is gone, then love is gone. But true love is actually defined by a commitment to suffer. And this is very important that we understand what true love is. Suffering is the crucible for love. You know, we do not learn true love anywhere else. Now, please do not misunderstand me. Suffering does not create love, but suffering provides the only circumstances where true love can emerge. So I want you to clearly differentiate between the, the happily ever after concept of marriage and the biblical concept of marriage where love is defined by a commitment to suffer. And because suffering provides the only circumstances where true love can emerge, you may now realize uh, why God is allowed uh, certain problems into your married life. Uh, it is to provide you the opportunity to learn what is true love. So God, God, is God is not concerned so much about our happiness. He is more concerned about our holiness. So you may wonder why your husband doesn't love you the way you had longed for. Or you may wonder why your wife does not respect you as you had expected she would you find yourself different from your spouse in so many ways that you even wonder if you made a mistake in finding God's will. Now, all these are realities in Christian life, in Christian married life. You live together, but there is no emotional connect. I want you to realize that this is God intervening in your life because he wants to break that happily married ever after dream and bring you into the crucible of suffering so that you may learn what true love is all about. He wants to bring you to your knees and that is God's purpose. So when God breaks you, you may even begin to doubt the possibility of true marriage in, in uh, uh, true love in married life. Uh, uh, there will be times when you feel abused, betrayed, victimized, and bitter. Have you read Matthew chapter 10, verse 36? Of course, it is very, it is not necessarily spoken of in the context of marriage, but it is still a principle that Jesus said, a person's enemies will be those in his own household. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, just as Jesus prayed, there will be times when you will pray, Father, please take this cup away. But when you receive grace from God, it will be possible for you to change that prayer, even as Jesus did, 
and make that prayer not why not my will but your O lord be done now when you realize that death is the center of love it is actually quietly liberating because instead of fighting death uh, that comes with love you actually embrace it as the cup that your father has given you to drink for a higher good now these are deep spiritual truths but unless we reach this point we are not going to be able to transform our married lives and when you reach that point a tiny resurrection occurs in your heart and you begin to die to self you begin to <clears throat> die to pride you die to expectations you die to rights and you die to dreams and you realize that jesus christ died on the cross to demonstrate what true love is all about so when god is dealing with you in this manner don't run away because god is actually answering your prayers he wants to bring change in your married life he wants to transform your married married life but it is only through the path of suffering it is only when you die to self when you die to pride when you die to expectations when you die to rights and die to dreams that a resurrection can happen in your married life now what is the standard set for the husband in the bible <clears throat> ephesians 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives as christ loved the church and gave himself for her this is the standard you have to die and give up as christ did that is the standard for the husband so things are very very clear in the bible the, the bible is very realistic there is there is no uh, in mincing of the words there when you get married when you choose to marry you actually choose to die and give up if husbands can just learn this one lesson that can enrich the quality of their marriage life that we are to die elizabeth elliot uh, most of you will know her she in her words said love means sacrifice the world tells us that love is feeling and we have been taken for a ride by that definition of love but the bible tells us that love is sacrifice each member of the family in one way or another has to learn to give in to give up and to give over for the sake of the rest so are you ready to give up are you ready to give in to give over in philippians chapter 2 verse 5 to 8 we read about jesus christ that he did not consider equality with god something to be grasped but emptied himself taking the form of a servant and humbled himself and became obedient to death five things are listed in those verses and it was all his example of how he gave up gave in and gave over when he had equality with the father now we have been asked to have this mind so the bible is very clear about how we can make our married life better but it requires this path and acceptance is the first response of true love god has accepted us in jesus christ just as we are the prodigal son's father accepted the son just as he came none of us are perfect we all have flaws and irritating habits we tend to be judgmental instead of being accepting and accepting the ambiguity in your spouse is truly the work of love in your heart a very important sentence i have put in bold here when you say i accept you it is in fact sometimes more powerful 
than saying I love you. So I want to encourage husbands and wives. Allow your husband to be who he is. Allow your wife to be who she is. Don't try to fix your spouse. Instead, focus on yourself. Fix yourself. When these changes take place, I am confident in the word of God that transformation will begin in your family. Now I want to elaborate a little more on the concept of love in the Bible. In the Old Testament especially, we read this word steadfast love. You know, That steadfast love, that word is not very common in today's uh, English language, but it, it has deep meaning. It is a stubborn type of love. It is inseparable from loyalty, you know, that love and loyalty go together. That is the concept of steadfast love. When the world says, act on your feelings, steadfast love says, no, act on your commitments. The feelings may come or may not come. Steadfast love is unbalanced and uneven. There is nothing fair about steadfast love. <clears throat> I have not only put the sentence in bold, but I have put in, it in red. <clears throat> you may argue that this is not fair. And I will agree with you because steadfast love, there is nothing fair about it. It is one way love, just as God loved us while we were yet sinners. It is agape love. This is the love to which we have been called. It's not whether your life partner is responding or not. It's not whether he or is loving you or she is respecting you. You have been commanded to steadfast love. And there's nothing fair about it. But when I, when I say all this, there is a great danger uh, which I want to alert you about. If when you fail to practice true biblical love, by which I mean steadfast love, where there is nothing fair, it is possible to give the impression that there is steadfast love when in fact you may have already ex exited the relation relationship emotionally. I know that there are many Christian families where they're simply living together. There is no emotional connect between the husband and wife. And the impression that the church gets or the others in the community get is that, oh, that's a good couple. They are a faithful husband and wife, but there's nothing really happening there. That is possible. If your spouse has hurt you, you may slip into emotional revenge. You may be hunting for bad news about your spouse or just running a magnifying glass over his or her character and brooding over the past. These are all possibilities, realities that may be happening in your life. And you may have created in your mind a world that does not exist. You know, we, we instead of living in the reality of our married life, we move into a hypothetic, hypothetical world and guys may be drawn to pornography, and women may be drawn to fantasy, uh, rom romance novels, or guys may be drawn to work, and women may be drawn to buying sprees or binge eating. So why do I say all this? I want you to locate where you are. Are you in a relationship where you have already exited emotionally and you are just hanging on together because of social pressures, because of the housing loan or something like that. But the uniqueness of steadfast love is that it can be reset and it can be reset without any difficulty because there is nothing fair about it. You don't need to wait for justice and fairness to come before you reset it. Do you get what I'm trying to say? You know, it depends only on you to reset steadfast love. 
if if you have steadfast love you can single handedly turn the tide of your marriage relationship not in a day but over time you will start seeing differences in a few months and i'm sure over a period of one year you will be able to notice perceivable differences if you unilaterally decide to demonstrate steadfast love so life is moody feelings will come and go pressures will rise and fall passions will ebb and flow but steadfast love will remain unchanging in the changing seasons of life only steadfast love can bring shalom a place of settled security and rest in your married life so i am using this opportunity to encourage you not necessarily both husband and wife together even unilaterally you can decide to turn the tide of your marriage relationship by committing to go through this path of suffering especially in this passion week it is probably a good time to recommit yourself to this so that you can experience a resurrection in your married life i want to take a quote from cs lewis of course i have adapted it slightly uh, to love is to be vulnerable in true love your heart will be wrung and broken to avoid that pain you can focus on work hobbies or little luxuries maybe a new car or a new gadget and thus you lock yourself in a coffin of your selfishness you may you may you may bring in a pet dog into your family none of these things are wrong work hobbies luxuries and pets are not wrong but we must examine ourselves if we are doing it unknown to our own minds as an escape from the reality of the suffering that we are having in exercising true love and in the process you may be actually locking yourself in a coffin of your selfishness and in that coffin safe dark motionless airless you will change you will become unbreakable unpenetrable irredeemable and thus your marriage will die a slow death instead be broken be vulnerable to redeem your marriage actually these are very profound thoughts uh, i have made a few changes just to make it relevant to our situation but the original words are from cs lewis and i think it tells us exactly what love is to love you it means to be vulnerable you will be broken it was going to be painful that is biblical love now the unconditionality of love you know when husbands made the covenant they did not commit to love their wife if she did a b and c he promised god that he will love her unconditionally so husband never blame your lack of love on your wife's lack of respect never tell your wife that she must earn your love in order for you to love her lack of love never motivates respect lack of love is simply disobedience to ephesians 5 verse 33 the husband is to love his wife unconditionally now how does the wife get to know that you love her she wants you to be close she wants you to be open to open up to her she wants you to confide in her don't try to fix her just listen to her she wants you to say i am sorry when you have gone wrong 
she needs to know that you are committed to her and she wants you to respect her and cherish her or to protect and care for her. Now, you can specifically ask her, what is the love language that you seek from me? And once you have understood her love language, do the hard work to learn to give that love language. So what I'm saying is that most of us just get married and hope that our marriage will get along, but we are not willing to work on our marriage. I think every relationship, if it has to be sustained, if it has to be nurtured, if it has to develop and improve, you have to work on it. You have to devote time for it. So it is important that you learn to communicate love to the wife in a manner that she understands it as love. You may think that you are loving her by certain things that you are doing, but that does not get translated as love to her. So you need to first find out what does love mean to her, and then you need to learn to do that. Now, where do you get the power to love when you are not getting love in return? Well, we have to go to some Old Testament passages where God said, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. They have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And in the New Testament, we read of Jesus Christ saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. What I'm, my answer to the question that I've given in the title of this slide is that unless you are continually plugged in to that never-ending source of love, you will never be empowered to love your spouse. Therefore, it is paramount, it is important that you go closer to God yourself first before you can begin loving your spouse. Instead of doing that, just as Jeremiah chapter 2 says, God tells us that you have forsaken me and you have tried to replace me by other sources of love or fulfillment that cannot hold water. You have to go to this source, Jesus Christ, from where you will get the rivers of living water, that endless source of love. You have to depend on the Holy Spirit for that. There is no other place where you will be refueled for what we are invited to do. So having said that much about love, let us now move on to respect. Where in the Bible is the wife instructed to love her husband? Have you asked that question? Actually, there is only one passing reference in Titus 2 verse 4, where it says, train the young women to love their husbands. Instead, the emphasis for the wife in the Bible is on submission and respect. Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, Ephesians 5.22. Be subject to your own husbands, 1 Peter 3.1. Submitting to their own husbands, 1 Peter 3, 5. Let the wife see that she respects her husband, Ephesians 5, 33. When, you see, when they see your respectful conduct, 1 Peter 3, 2. What I'm trying to say is that the Bible emphasizes love for the husband, but the same Bible emphasizes submission and respect for the wife. So just as I said in the case of the husband, the wife is to respect her husband unconditionally. The wife did not commit to respect her husband subject to his doing his duty. That is not how the marriage, Christian marriage vows are framed. Wife, never blame your lack of respect on your husband's lack of love. Never tell your husband 
that he must learn earn your respect in order for you to respect her lack of respect is simply disobedience to ephesians 5:33 so only you your commitment to submit to god can enable you to respect a husband in whom you may find nothing much to respect it is because of your commitment to god that you will be able to respect your husband now most women listening to me may object saying that me alex i am a male chavinist preacher from a patriotic society i am i am i i can understand that complaint but you may be saying that you are out to set up women for a life of sub subservience if i respect my husband i will end up being a doormat this may be the complaints that you that are the thoughts that are going on in your heart how can i respect him when i do not feel any respect for him i will be a hypocrite how can i forgive him for the things that he has said about me and my family all the above questions are genuine questions on which the husband should definitely ponder upon the husbands need to think through these uh, points that the wife can raise and at the same time i want to assure you ladies that the biblical approach will never render you powerless on the other hand it will empower you negativity does not empower complaining does not empower by showing unconditional respect to your husband you will raise in stature now i do not want you to bury your brains never show your leadership ability never disagree in the slightest way that's not what i'm asking for i do not want you to ignore your hurts and your vulnerabilities you know mothering or instructing is what women instinctively do for children but please abstain from mothering your husband that is not what your husband likes that is not what the bible tells wives to do do not preach to your husband you may preach to your children but please do not preach to your husband for the husband respect gets translated as genuine appreciation for his desire to work and to achieve to protect and to provide to serve and to lead to analyze and counsel for shoulder to shoulder friendship and for sexual intimacy i am telling in this slide how the wife should communicate respect for the husband very often the wife thinks that oh i do respect him but he does not get that message for the husband you have to search out those rare occasions that you really respect him for what he did and you have to keep rewinding that tape in your conversations you can specifically ask him what is the love language that you want from me and you must do the hard work to learn that love language for him now my emphasis is that the male ego needs appreciation every day and women should learn to appreciate their husbands for the work the all these things that i have listed here they need appreciation they they thrive on appreciation and that appreciation is what gets translated as respect now let me ask the question why are some husbands workaholic not all husbands are workaholic some husbands actually are lazy and they need to be kicked into action most often but not always the husband becomes a workaholic when he gets more respect and admiration from his workplace wives please take note of this while at home 
his wife is negative, complaining, and disrespectful. Such husbands, they whistle as they drive to work on Monday morning. On Friday evening, when he comes back from office, he comes back with a drooped head. Not because he has had a hard week at office, but because he has a hard weekend before him. So it is very important for some wives to understand that they may be the very cause of their husband's workaholism. In Proverbs 21 verse 9, it reads, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop, just as you see in this picture, than to live in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. So if your husband has moved to a secluded corner of your house, you need to ask yourself if you have been the cause for it. Disrespect never motivates love. Whining, contempt will not draw the husband home. I'm not asking you to respect all that he is doing at his workplace. Work may be a negative obsession in his life, but you can search for non-work areas to express respect. Something like this. I'm just giving an example. I like the way you drive. We have never had a major accident with you at the driving seat. See how our kids lighten up when daddy comes home. You are a significant influence in their life. These are words by which we communicate genuine respect for the husband. And these things remain deeply embedded in the husband's heart and they will transform. Would you like to take our son out for a date night dinner? Just you and him alone. I'm giving you certain examples so that you can think about how you can be genuine in your respect. Now, the problem of nagging has been, has been emphasized in the Bible. Once the wife has given a suggestion to her husband, she ought to wait for at least three weeks before bringing up that topic again. And when you remind your husband after three weeks, make sure you do it with a positive message. Something like, did you consider my, my suggestion? So this is the way you can handle your own tendency to nag. You see, quietness shouts to a husband while nagging cuts him off. A gentle spirit will bring out the gentleman in him. If you cannot say anything respectful, please say nothing at all. Please remain quiet. Do not communicate contempt with a grumpy face. Nonverbal cues are far, there's a spelling mistake there, are far more trusted than the verbal cues. So I want to recap what we have been learning today. Uh, I want you to ditch the dream idea and they lived happily ever after. For true love to emerge, God will bring you to a place of brokenness. Death is the center of love. Only when death occurs, there is hope for resurrection. Total acceptance of the spouse is the first response of love. Biblical love is stubborn, steadfast, unchanging commitment. Biblical love is unfair, so be vulnerable and reset love unilaterally. You are called to love and respect unconditionally. Do not, not to love and not to respect is plain disobedience to scripture. These are the eight points that I have had, I have tried to highlight in today's session. And uh, I want to conclude by saying, husband, the best way to motive, 
persuade your wife is by meeting her need for love. And if you have failed to love your wife, do something loving today. Wife, the best way to motivate your husband is by meeting his need for respect. If you have failed to respect your husband, do something respectful today. Now, I had been... Uh, I had been given one question to respond, uh, and that question is about handling spousal infidelity. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on this question that was uh, handed over to me. You see, ultimately, every situation is different. In some cases, a long-term relationship may not have been the agenda of the erring spouse. Now, by that, I'm not discounting the moral error. I'm not saying that the, the person has not made a mistake. The person has sinned. In some case, the fall may have occurred in an hour of weakness, and the erring spouse is deeply repentant and genuinely wanting to change. Now, such, must, such people must be given a second chance, even though they have sinned. But in most cases, there would have been a slow buildup in failure to fulfill marital duty for which both partners are responsible. And in almost all cases, preemptive boundaries may not have been put in place. You see, what I'm trying to say is passwords for cell phones, email IDs, social media platforms must be shared and devices must be accessible for, to both partners. This is a preemptive boundary that ought to be in every committed Christian marriage. But if this was not existing, then you have laid the ground rules for infidelity to take place without the knowledge of the other spouse. So, if you are experiencing infidelity, if one of the life partners has uh, been unfaithful, you must take time to process your emotions. Finding out that your spouse has been unfaithful can be a shock. And it is normal to feel denial, anger, sadness, betrayal, and confusion. You must allow yourself time to heal and you must practice self-care such as getting enough sleep, exercising and eating healthy. Now you must examine yourself and maybe you need to take a break. When your spouse is involved in an extramarital affair, you cannot absolve yourself from all responsibility. Spend time alone with God to find out where you had gone wrong. Examine how you were responsible by failing to fulfill your duty. Examine how your actions or your inaction may have contributed to the distancing. You may also want to consider taking a break from your spouse. Confide with a wise senior couple whom you know will not gossip and adhere to the step-by-step -step biblical directive given by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 18. What do these verses tell us? If your brother sins against you, step one, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, step two, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to them, step three, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, step four, let him be to you a Gentile and a tax collector. That means separation or moving out. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, 
and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These are the practical guidelines for us to follow. So step one is communicating with your spouse. It is important to have an honest and open conversation with your spouse about the situation. You must ask them to be truthful about what happened and why it happened. Express how their actions have made you feel and try to understand their perspective too. Once trust has been betrayed, it is the erring spouse's responsibility to regain trust. And that is not going to be easy. But if you find that the erring spouse is serious about regaining trust, I would encourage you to hang on to the relationship despite your having proof of unfaithfulness. Step number two, seek support. If you have not been able to resolve the issue between yourselves, precipitate the issue rather than suffer in silence. Reach out to family, friends, or a therapist for emotional support. Seek professional help to work through your emotions. And move to step two in the Matthew chapter 18 passage by submitting a formal complaint to the responsible elders or pastors who will help you figure out the next best course of action. Good church leadership will initiate steps three and four as part of church discipline. Now, step two, you need to decide what you want. You know, once you have had a time to process your emotions and understand the situation, it is important to decide what you want for yourself and for your relationship. Do you want to try to work through the issue with your spouse or do you want to end the relationship? Either way, the choice will have consequences. God hates divorces. All divorces are occasioned by sin, but not all divorces are sinful, by which I mean that in cases of adultery, divorce may be justified. This is my personal viewpoint. Now, separation may be needed until both are willing and able to reunite. If you are physically abused, please do not hesitate to call the police immediately. This is what I mean by saying precipitate the issue and do not put the issues under the blanket. Prevention is better than cure. So don't take your marriage relationship for granted. Guard it. Hard work to improve your marriage relationship in a fallen world. And don't brush issues under the carpet. Address them. If your marriage is under stress, be mentally, physically, and financially prepared to be single again. Initiate separate accounts so that you are financially independent. Scout for alternative places to stay. Be packed and ready to move out at short notice. This is if you find that you are really in very, very bad state of affairs in your married life. Love must be tough. But at the same time, the divine design for marriage is that it is meant for life. So I have addressed this uh, question that was given to me. Now it is question and answer time. You can either unmute yourself and ask the question. Probably the recording will be put off. Uh, you can, or you can post publicly in the chat box or you can post your question directly to me. I will not reveal your name. It is not that I have the answers to all your questions, but I still love questions because they help us all to think further. So please use the time and thank you for this opportunity. I will now uh, stop sharing my slides, but as I did last time, this uh, these slides also I shall send to Jinu uh, as a PDF.